Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. All right guys, so today we're gonna attempt to break it all down for you. There's some good news and there's some bad news. Mostly bad news, but what I really wanna talk about in this video is why the US involvement in this war is the way it is. And this is very important. This is the big picture, okay? This is the big enchilada we're gonna be talking about today. Now, before that though, just to ride on the coattails of our last video at Uncle Wiener's, because I know you guys like that fun stuff once in a while. This is a WorkSharp mini guided field sharpener. This is an awesome little tool that I use all the time and it was perfectly made for my EDC knife, which is a bench made bug out, okay? It has this bit driver in here, which has bits that are pretty much made for this knife in particular. So if you have a bench made bug out or if you wanna get one, you know, go get one of these little sharpeners. It's got a uh, ceramic guided edge, then it also has a coarse diamond edge. And if you haven't used a knife a lot, you'd be amazed at how much you have to sharpen that knife, which is why I carry this on me because uh, I need a knife sharpener. I don't like those ones where you, you go like that, the V sharpeners are not good for your knives, but this is just perfect, man. And this Benchmade bug out is the best EDC knife, I think, in my opinion. It's not heavy, it's lightweight. The problem with heavy EDC knives is that one day, you're just not gonna wanna carry it anymore. You're gonna forget it at home and you're gonna be like, gee, I feel really light today. You know, I don't like carrying around that big bulky thing. This Benchmade bug out, man, it's perfect. Absolutely perfect and this goes with it and it's also lightweight. If you don't wanna carry the bit driver around, you don't have to, you can take it out and just use the, uh, the uh, sharpener. The only thing I wish it had was a fine diamond as opposed to a coarse. I would prefer just a fine diamond and a ceramic and maybe even a leather strop on here. But anyways, I just wanted to show you guys a little piece of gear. Now let's get to the video. Okay, so here's what people need to understand. And oftentimes we, we only see what's right in front of our face as taxpayers, and it's understandable. Uh, the Biden administration passing this $40 billion bill, which will, uh, you know, $40 billion for armaments to Ukraine, on its face seems ludicrous when you think about how many people are struggling just to put gas in their car and the various shortages but the long game, it kind of makes sense because here's what's gonna happen if the US loses its global reserve currency status, okay? The US dollar has the reserve status right now. And that means that all countries in order to buy oil need the US dollar. So many countries buy US bonds, they buy US treasuries, they hold US dollars because that's the global reserve currency. And, and because of that, the US can print immense amounts of debt without ever having to deal with the monetary devaluation. That is until it collapses, okay? And now if it were to collapse, this $40 billion will seem like chump change. And that's the hard pill for people to swallow, is that it's likely going to collapse but the Russians and the Chinese right now, those two countries in particular, as well as the other BRICS countries, are looking at creating their own reserve currency and increasingly more and more, more people, or more countries I should say, are moving to the yuan and now likely the ruble uh, if Russia is successful in this campaign. And that is going to, it, it, could, cause, it could cause the abrupt collapse of the US dollar losing its reserve currency status, in which case the dollar is not going to collapse altogether, but you're going to see massive inflation. I mean, inflation, unlike anything you've ever seen, in inflation like devaluation, the likes of which we just haven't seen yet. For perspective, in 1944, the British pound lost its global reserve currency status. Since that time, price inflation has increased nearly 5,000% for the British pound, okay? So that's something we need to put in perspective. And on top of that, the US fall will be much harder because there's a lot more US dollars out there. The world's an entirely different place than it was when the British had the reserve currency. 
So this is why, guys, and I'm not saying that I want it this way, but this is why the U.S. is so hell-bent on keeping the Russians down. Because they know if they can't keep the Russians and the Chinese down, which ultimately it seems like they may not, then we're screwed in the long run. You see, the fact of the matter is there's going to be a new world order. It really comes down to who's going to control it, who's going to be at the helm of it. The United States has been the global currency for the longest time. They essentially have been the, the new world order for the long time. But now that hegemony is being challenged, and that is going to create uh, massive, massive inflation, and it is going to cause possibly a long, dark depression and just the collapse of our, our any industry that we have remaining here in North America. Because, of course, Canada is strongly tethered to the U.S. dollar, as are most Western countries. Now, why Ukraine is so significant is that it's, it's a tipping point, right? It's kind of like uh, a teeter-totter, you know? You know, it seems as though, you know, NATO expansion is, uh, and, and NATO GDP, if you look at GDP, and you factor in what are the wealthiest countries in the world, it seems like NATO has Russia completely outgunned. But all it takes is a little, you know, just a little counterweight to start tipping the scales until you have that runaway tipping point, right? And Ukraine is that, because... Ukraine has revealed that NATO is weak in some ways, that NATO in all of its glory couldn't, in, in all of its military potential could not defeat the Russians. Now, some people would say, well, NATO didn't exactly fight the war, but I think everybody and their dog knows what's going on in terms of this being a proxy war. You know, it's been said uh, explicitly by some statesmen. So, I think it goes without saying that uh, this, is, this is causing people to lose confidence, not only in the US dollar as a reserve currency, but it's also a shock to countries who've seen the amount of sanctions that were immediately put on Russia and seen their inability to, to utilize their dollars okay, that they had. And uh, this is scaring a lot of countries into want to partake in the US dollar reserve currency system and people see the power shifting which is why the u.s is dumping everything and anything they can into this war because they know it's existential this is an existential war for either side it's an existential war for the u.s petrodollar it's an existential war for russia who views it as you know potentially ending their national sovereignty if nato pushes the boundaries to the russian border that's when Russia busts out the nuclear card, potentially. Now, we're seeing this issue die down a lot in U.S. media because it's being overshadowed by a lot of the civil discourse. It's something we talked about a couple months ago when you know, it seemed like the, the media tide was turning on their reporting of this, this war. And so it seems like now the focus is back on creating civil discourse for political reasons. Um, now, what could potentially happen, though, is that as a last-ditch Hail Mary, because remember, no president hasn't been elected, hasn't been re-elected during a time of war, during an actual time when the country has declared war. So should the United States actually declare war on somebody, you know, we don't know who that's going to be. Obviously, if they declared war on Russia, that's when we're at DEFCON 2, you know, permanently. I mean, I'd say we're at DEFCON 2 right now, at least Europe is. But uh, that would be, you know, a permanent somewhere in between DEFCON 2, DEFCON 1, meaning that the nuclear planes are, are in the air and just waiting for the order, okay? Now, if there is some outright declaration of war or if there is some major event that transpires between now and then. That could be induced by hackers. Uh, it could be some saboteurs. It could be, you know, some people say false flag. 
you know, it, it, you just never know nowadays. But something could happen that catapults us into this war in a major way and puts us on a real war footing. That would likely be, at this point, looking at all the data points across Ukraine, which appear to show that the Russians are really making uh, incredibly rapid progress right now. Uh, not progress, it, it's not a cakewalk by any stretch of the means, but they're making a lot of progress. And if that's the case, that's a death knell for the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. Because if they lose Ukraine, that's when all the dominoes start to fall. I think that's what a lot of people don't realize. Like, there's a lot of people who are, you know, who are just the ones who are like uh, trying to support Ukraine because they think that's the good thing to do. That, that's mostly people on the left, right? Then there's uh, people who are critical of the war who are on the right uh, because they're anti-interventionists, which is kind of ironic historically. But anyways... Um, there's also, you know, I guess another third rail of all of this, which is that if we don't do something, okay, then, you know, the Russians, even if you go with the argument that they were just defending their, you know, the NATO encroachment that has been happening over the last 20 years, there's a possibility that they say, you know what, you know, we push this far, why not go further, okay? I'm not saying they're going to do that, um, that... That is kind of an argument which is put forth by many who tend to demonize and blame Russia for everybody's problems and use Russia as a scapegoat for inflation and all the rest. Uh, but there is a likelihood that if Russia wins the battle, number one, that means that the, the monetary uh, power balance in the world is going to shift eastward, which will be bad for the U.S. And it's, like I said, it's going to make that $40 billion loss look like chump change when your currency is devalued in the trillions of dollars. When all those uh, dollars that are out there uh, come home to roost, you know, this might be good for some people who are on the other side of the debt, but for people holding U.S. dollars, it's going to be a bad day, a very bad day. It's not going to happen all in one day, but, you know, this is something to keep in mind, and we have to keep this big picture in mind. Now, I'm not saying that this 40 billion that it's not you know military industrial complex there's not corruption there's not definitely uh, corruption within you know certain political circles but there's a lot we don't know about how the world is run okay there's a reason why we have central intelligence agencies in Canada we have CSIS and we have these uh, higher levels of government and even a deep state arguably that knows things that we don't in order to, <laughs> this is going to sound naive, but keep us safe. And we have, to, we have to consider the possibility that maybe they are trying to prevent this Russia-China monetary reserve currency from, from transpiring, which of course would kill the U.S. dollar. I mean, it would be the end of the U.S. empire. And that, of course, would cost us a lot more money. So that's, that's playing the devil's advocate. That's trying to steel man our own arguments. You guys know I'm very outspoken about my criticisms about the military-industrial complex and you know, our involvement in this war. But these are things we have to consider if we're thinking people. Now, the good news is, is that there appears that there may be some NATO concessions along the Kaliningrad row, if you know about that. That's uh, Kaliningrad's the exclave of Russia. I've explained this many times before, but for people who are just tuning into the channel, Kaliningrad is a very strategically important uh, exclave of Russia, which is deeper into Europe, and they're trying to blockade this territory, meaning that Russia can't get goods in and out of there, at least not through land. They can go by sea or by air, which of course is more expensive and uh, costly. I guess those two things mean the same thing, don't they? Got so much in my head right now, guys. Um, there have, it appears, been some concessions on NATO's side. And apparently, they're talking about actually allowing goods to flow into Kaliningrad unimpeded once again from Russia to Russia, uh, keeping the ban in place 
with respect to the Baltic states trading with Russia in terms of sanctions, okay? Uh, we also have this U.S. civil unrest, which I know it's not uh, good in the long run, but it's, it's good in the sense that it's, it's uh, taking attention away from, you know, people that uh, have bigger fish to fry at home and Americans are not going to be as gung-ho about fighting a war any longer. You also have Zelensky's advisors walking back various uh, intentions to join NATO. And today, one of his advisors had indicated that they no longer want, or they admit that they're never going to be a part of NATO, but they want security guarantees, which is kind of the bad news, which is essentially being a part of NATO, because that's why you're a part of NATO, is for the security guarantees. So it's kind of a moot point, I guess. But then you also have NATO uh, Secretary General uh, Jen Stoltenberg saying that this conflict will ultimately have to end in diplomacy and peace talks, which isn't really saying much because ultimately that's how every war has to end. But those are the, the more dovish, more bullish uh, points to talk about today. Now, in terms of the negatives, the cons, the, the bad news, uh, the EU countries have are, are pursuing a uh, import ban on Russian gold. And this may be good or bad for the gold market. Uh, the reason why is unknown. I, I really don't, I haven't really looked deep into this one, but it is, it's interesting to me. And that's a point of escalation as well, okay? Russia is going to be sending nuclear capable missiles, the Iskanders, to Belarus within the next couple months. Uh, it was also suspected that Belarus had been a launching point for a recent major attack on Ukrainian territory. Now, this isn't really entirely nothing new. Of course, uh, Russia used Belarus as a staging ground to stage the initial invasion uh, that attempted to take Kiev. And, uh, but it's a point of escalation in light of all the, the military buildups on the, uh, the border between Belarus and Ukraine, the Belarusians mining their borders, and just a lot of the intensified rhetoric that's come out of those two countries. We have the increasing deaths of foreign fighters in Ukraine. Uh, apparently the Russians took out 80 Polish soldiers in an airstrike recently. Not Polish soldiers, but mercenaries. And increasingly more so, these guys are being caught. And uh, it's, becoming, it's becoming really obvious and explicit. And I think it's only a matter of time before Russia says, hey, like, this is... This is kind of getting ridiculous now, right? You have people speaking perfect, fluent English uh, with British accents shooting us with NATO armaments in Ukraine. Hmm. You know, it's no surprise that, uh, <laughs> what does this guy say? London will be bombed in World War III, says Russian TV propagandist, as he rails against West and claims its clear threat to the world comes from the Anglo-Saxons, not from Europe. Also, we have Russian Baltic Sea uh, fleets start landing exercises in Kaliningrad region. Russian threats to bomb London for Kaliningrad blockade. That's from Ukrainian news. Uh, the list goes on in terms of stories like that. We also have that... Um, what else do we have? <laughs> Lost my train of thought here. Okay, so there was also an event that transpired. Somebody sent me an email about this. I probably should have talked about this first, but I, I don't really know uh, how valid of a claim it is. So they suspect that there was an event that happened this morning. They sent me a uh, flight radar showing the, the actual uh, event that had transpired. An event happened this morning unlike any they've ever seen in history to date. In the early hours of the morning and completely out of the blue, Russia sent up surveillance aircraft that went completely around the entire border of Kaliningrad, presumably mapping the terrain. This sparked a major response and scramble from NATO, the likes of which have never been seen before. B-35, CL-60, and P-90... P-68 NATO aircraft all responded and started surveillance of the Kaliningrad border and of the Russian aircraft, which led to a standoff for several hours. And he showed me all the diagrams that show the flight paths of all this. This includes a NATO aircraft 
call sign Hunter flying just off the coast, which is actively jamming the Russian surveillance aircraft. During this time, a Russian troop transporter took off from Kaliningrad and burst into flames and then crashed in Kaliningrad shortly after. No idea as to what the cause is as of yet. I have never in seen in five years of aircraft surveillance so many surveillance aircraft in one spot. In fact, I'm pretty sure it has never happened ever. Uh, please see the attached in dark blue. I can't, I couldn't find any news to confirm that there was a crash thereafter, but I will say that this just goes to show that there is a lot happening that doesn't get reported on the level of global military strategy. And when you're talking about global military strategy, you're talking about nuclear war. So there's a lot going on that we don't hear about. And uh, there's a war being fought behind the scenes, cyber or otherwise, that we don't hear about. You know, people are talking about all these uh, gas facilities blowing up, oil facilities blowing up, you know, food processing plants blowing up. A lot of this could be cyber. You know, we just don't know. Uh, they're, they're seemingly not um, wanting to admit when it is anymore because there's just been way too many coincidences in the last, and I'm not saying the food stuff, I'm talking more about the natural gas and the LNG plant that blew up and all of these things. There's been way too many coincidences in the energy industry in particular. I don't know enough about the food to know whether or not that's just a standard, you know, um, amount of fires that happen every year because we know there's thousands of those uh, processing plants and really has it really put a dent in things I don't know it's hard to say but uh, it seems like there's too much to be coincidental so that's the gist of what I'm trying to say today guys is that there is a reason why they're doing seemingly insane things because the U.S. is not ready to fight a ground war in Europe. Europe's not ready to fight a ground war in Europe. We're going to have Dr. Peter Pry on Monday. Actually, the, the video is probably not going to air until later next week. But he's going to be back and talking about the realities of nuclear conflict. And that it is not as unsurvivable as a lot of people think. This guy's an expert. He's, you know, worked for the president, he's worked for the CIA, like he knows what he's talking about. And uh, it's, you need to understand that there's people out there who think that a nuclear war is winnable. And that's scary because of course, we don't ever wanna have that transpire because just because something is winnable doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy. And it certainly won't be easy. Let me know what you think in the comment sections below. I will say, just as a final point of good news, JP Morgan is saying that uh, hedge funds are going to be balancing their portfolios next week, and that's going to lead to a 7% jump in the stock market. Who knows? Possibly. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not putting too much, too many eggs in that basket. Let me know what you guys think. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out.